Uh, my name is Brian Failing. I'm the former museum curator for the museums at Lyle Station Park. Uh, joining you today to bring the 10th annual virtual Chicago author series for you. Uh, this year we're doing a smaller series. Uh, we got two programs, one this weekend and then next weekend, uh, Dr. Ann Keating from North Central College will be joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully you'll join in uh, next weekend as well. Uh, she'll be talking about Juliet Kinsey. Um, on this anniversary, we are joined by our first presenter from the first series in 2010, Kermit Eby. Uh, Kermit is working on his PhD in education at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, he's a former educator at Naperville North High School, uh, where he created the urban history curriculum. Uh, that's where I first uh, you know, got acquainted with Kermit. Uh, we started the author series back in 2010 uh, when I was uh, the curator of the museum. And uh, currently, uh, Kermit is teaching uh, historical methods and supervising student teachers at a variety of colleges across um, our region. Uh, so today, uh, Kermit will be talking about the changing educational landscape, uh, reflecting on his time in education, looking at his grandfather from when he was a professor at the University of Chicago, and just looking at how education has been shaped over the last decade, or not decade, well, over the past century uh, in the region. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kermit. Uh, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'm welcoming other boomers, I'm assuming, and, and I would really be curious to know where you're all from, um, what questions, I mean, if you grew up in Chicago or if there are any questions that you have. And, and I think there's a way that you can ask questions uh, during this through, a, um, through the chat mechanism right here. So if you have any questions while I'm going along, I'd, I'd much rather talk less and talk with um, all of you um, in the process. I'm trying to see as I'm using this, I'm going to write out questions. And then you will have a means to ask me questions through that chat mechanism. I don't know if you've seen it, if you see it, but um, so Brian, uh, Brian is a student of mine, or was a student enrolled at Naperville North many years ago. He and his brother uh, were both amazing students. So I, I'm hoping I can live up to the standards that they um, lived up to. Um, I, I taught at Naperville North for 36 years. Um, I started teaching way back in 1980, and I'm currently teaching at North Central College, a course in methods in social studies. And at Wheaton College, I supervise student teachers. I just um, observed one of my student teachers yesterday remotely. Um, they're under incredible uh, pressure that, you know, in 2020 for a variety of reasons, but mostly because they can't see their students either, just like I can't see Bev and Marilyn and Gloria and Eric and, <laughs> but if you, but I can see Joan, so hi Joan. <laughs> um, and I'm also finishing up my doctorate um, at the ripe old age of 63. Um, I'll be the first of three Kermit Ebies uh, to finish my PhD, if I defend it this fall, um, grandfather was a, ended his career as a professor at the University of Chicago, where he was hired by uh, Hutchins um, in the 40s. Um, and Kermit, you know, I brought out one of his books. I have all of his stuff that I've lived with as a third. Um, he started out as a um, as a professor there in the 40s and um, experienced um, much of the culture wars that we're experiencing during the McCarthy era um, as a being called in front of the House on an American Activities Committee. Um, as a um, radical educator, he had, <clears throat> excuse me, um, traveled through the early 20th century as an activist and um, much of his career as an educator um, was um, seen as a threat to the status quo. Um, and so 
Kermit, my name Kermit, um, has has influenced me tremendously in, in my career, and that's why I'm kind of completing a, a biography. And when Brian asked me to to do this, I thought, oh, what a great way to do it! I could talk about Chicago and education, um, and um, how that all began for me in my pursuit. It's biographical. Uh, to me, history is very personal. Um, and if we can hear the stories, like the story core on NPR, of our students and of each other, uh, we can find some commonality. Um, so um, I was going to begin with this this pursuit. Um, Ann Keating's the real Chicago historian. If you come and hear her speak next week, um, she will give you incredible detail. Um, so let me start with um, this. Uh, the first E.B. to come to Chicago uh, was Carol E.B. Um, Carol E.B., who was a Mennonite missionary from Ohio, and she was a part of an indirect um, response to the industrial, um, the industrial problems that people were experiencing in Chicago as laborers and um, coming to Chicago and during a, an incredibly um, difficult time. Um, Carol, Carol as a Mennonite was coming to to be a, of service, um, and she lived in Chicago on the south side of Chicago in the um, ethnic communities of laborers, and so that's my first experience um, in Chicago. Now I'm saying this in a transgenerational way. I'm saying that I didn't personally experience it, but from her diaries, I know what she experienced as um, as a, a, a farm girl moving to the city with her husband uh, as a part of the Mennonite Relief Services. Now, the, the next time um, an EB comes to Chicago, or one of my relatives is Vernon Schwalm, who was the son of a preacher, a, 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 a Church of the Brethren, or a, a, a Dunkard. And, and he came to Chicago in the 19... 9, 10, 11. He went to the University of Chicago um, in 1914. He had a direct influence on my grandfather, Kermit, who was born in 1902 and came to the University of Chicago after um, his four years at Manchester College in Indiana, uh, which is also where I'm a graduate of. Manchester College, a Church of the Brethren undergraduate school. I was the third Kermit Eby to graduate from Manchester College with a degree in education and social studies. Um, and so I'm a part of this legacy of progressive Mennonite brethren educators who've come to Chicago to help in, in what we thought was a social justice movement that begins as early as uh, Jane Addams uh, coming to Chicago as a Quaker um, and, and setting up the Hull House. And education was central to her, to her um, legacy and, and agency in Chicago. So we can easily go back to Chicago to the 1820s and 30s and see you know, schoolhouses appearing for the wealthy. Uh, whether or not the working people of the 18 60s and 70s and 80s had had access to education is is central to Chicago's um, to the Chicago history of education. When Catholics start moving in um, in the 1870s and 80s from um, Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, they begin to see the Protestant schools that were created um, as kind of a, um, a competition for their children's um, religious um, principles and education. So Catholic schools are created beginning in the 1870s and 80s. And, and I already promised to Tiffany and Brian that I, I will do a PowerPoint and send it to you guys with the specifics of this. But one of the earliest and most contentious periods in public education in Chicago is this tension between Catholic education and Protestant education. And the Protestants controlled the secular institutions of public schools and the Catholics wanted an alternative. And you see that today. Um, I experienced that directly when I moved to Chicago in 1981 by teaching at Gordon Tech. Um, and Gordon Tech was a, a 
Catholic school um, led by the a, a brother by brothers who um, dominated football. It was a, it was the largest all boys school in Chicago um, at the time, um, and it was it was near um, Lane Tech. And if any of you know Lane Tech, maybe some of you are graduates and even got an opportunity to visit it. But Lane Tech is central to Chicago history, uh, created in the early 20th century, I think about 1907 or 1908. But Lane Tech was built as not as a public education for liberal education, but for technical education. And it became the center of, um, of, of Lane Tech became one of the centers for the development of um, of, tech, of, of technicians and um, and uh, industrial workers. Um, I have actually met one of my students' grandfather went to Lane Tech and learned um, airplane technology at Lane Tech. And they, there's actually, if anybody gets a chance, there's a still at Lane Tech. There's an area where they had airplanes that kids learned how to work on, and um, in the 1930s and 40s in preparation for World War II. Lane Tech is a massive structure. If you ever get a chance to go visit it, it's on the corner of Western and Lawrence. Um, and um, but anyway, that's another story. So my first experience in Chicago in the 1980s was at a Catholic school and which prep prepared me very well as a, a Mennonite brethren boy to be able to go into the secular schools of, um, and, and get paid a lot better um, with what we call unions. And that would be another issue that we could talk about. Um, race, ethnicity, poverty, all of these issues can be seen in the public schools of Chicago. Um, Another anecdote I'll share. Um, my first demonstration uh, was in 1962. I was five years old. My father took me to the south side of Chicago. Um, Martin Luther King had visited my grandfather at, um, at his home um, when he was teaching at the University of Chicago and my father became active in the civil rights movement. Um, we were living in Park Forest, Illinois at the time. He was a principal there my father, Kermit Eby Jr. And he got to know John Johnson of Ebony Magazine and Johnson & Johnson Publishing and Lerone Bennett Jr. Um, I have several of Lerone Bennett's books up here, but um, Lerone was, uh, he wrote a book called Before the Mayflower in the 1950s, was, which was a history of the black experience. So anyway, my first demonstration when I was five years old was a we were some of the few of, of several of the white folk that showed up to this. And you guys all know the history of Chicago and uh, the history of segregation and integration. So when we took this, when we went on this march, I was introduced as a five-year-old to this conflict over within Chicago and the ethnic communities and the divisions that existed in Chicago. We still see that today. Um, and I could go through the Black Lives Matter that I went to, the Black Lives Matter march that I went to seven years ago, or I could talk about the student exchanges that um, my students used to uh, participate in at Kenwood, at Sen, um, at, um, uh, on the north side. Um, we actually took students into the Robert Taylor homes and, and did community service there. Um, and we did a student exchange at an elementary school in the Robert Taylor homes. Um, we went and worked with a second and third grade classroom. This would have been about 1997, which they would never consider doing today. But the division within the schools and between the schools is still palpable um, to me and to our community because we, we see the divisiveness that it's causing in our, our political um, system, which is all the other reason why I wore my mask today. Don't forget to vote, everybody. Um, it, I, I and I'm a I'm an election judge, so I've already voted, and I'm I get to see firsthand um, um, this year in 2020 events that don't look that dissimilar to what was happening in Chicago in 1919 during the race riots, or 1968 when 
hoping that some of the boomers remember uh, because I, I'll never forget as an 11 year old watching the Democratic National Convention or watching Mayor Daley uh, telling people to use police to shoot to kill if people were um, um, involved in destroying property, which was to me a very natural reaction to what people were experiencing. And, and that might be something um, a little bit um, a little bit too controversial, but I, I'm going to go there anyway. Brian knows I, I'm, I tend not to edit my thoughts sometimes, but anyway. So when we're talking about education in Chicago. For me, it's a very personal experience. Um, having been raised in Chicago, having lived in Chicago for 20 years, um, I actually was a, a, I taught at Sen High School for one year. Um, I'm not Sen High School, Austin High School on the west side in Austin. Um, when we were living in, in um, this would have been 1990. And if you guys know the history of Austin, you know the history of segregation in Chicago. Sen had the largest, Austin High School had the largest um, public high school in, in the United States at one time. Austin is now one of the most dangerous neighborhoods if you look at it from the perspective of gun violence. Um, and uh, it also used to be a center of the Jewish community. Um, as the Jewish community moved out of Maxwell Street, moved west into Lawndale, then to Austin, and then ended up in Rogers Park and in Evanston and Skokie. Um, you can see how ethnic groups, as they gain economic security and travel through this map of Chicago, that's another map you, you might want to look at, the, um, the, the, the changes in, in the ethnic community. Another great book that explains this so well um, is called The Warmth of Other Suns um, by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, it, it's, a, it's a description of the black migration that begins in 1919. Um, and seven million black Americans move from the South in the Confederacy to the North. Um, Michelle Obama is the descendant of the first generation of, of, a, of, of, of crop um, of, of Southern black folk who moved to Chicago for greater opportunity. So when you look at Chicago, you know this ethnic um, movement that you know that, that that we see described and seen today. The division, the divisiveness, um, is clearly rooted in the history of Chicago. I'm jumping all over the place. I apologize. Um, it, it, um, when, when I go down here, I'm going to end this and then take some questions. I hope we can um, discuss it. Um, when I, I'm, I've been a student at the University of Illinois at Chicago for my master's degree in history and my PhD in education. And when I go down to UIC, I see America, I see Chicago, I see diversity. I see this collection of Americans seeking this dream um, that all of us see education as a possibility. And so when I'm writing my, um, this book about my father and my grandfather and my great uncle, I, I am, I'm having this transgenerational dialogue about school. Um, and, and, and education and the opportunity to do well. And, and if, 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 if that ends, um, I, I, I think if the dream of access to public education um, ends, I feel like the dream is being diminished uh, because that's our access to not only middle class, but the middle class, but also to an, um, an understanding of who we are within our own history. Um, I, I was telling Brian, again, I'm tangenting. Um, this is why I need a script. <laughs> um, Brian and Tiffany, that I was doing a tour of the um, Waltheim Cemetery um, um, yesterday for some Chicago history classes. And if you guys know the Waltheim Cemetery, it's Forest Home Cemetery. When you go down the Eisenhower Expressway, um, you see, I always tell my kids, this is where you had to hold your breath for 60 seconds because of all those graves. Um, there are 188,000 people buried in those in, in those graveyards. There, um, there are only 30,000, I think, in Forest Park. So the dead um, are, are are have a higher well. There are more dead folk living there than 
well, I shouldn't say living, but anyway. So when I go to a graveyard, I can learn from the people who have preceded us, just like I can still learn from my grandfather and his books. He had an unpublished book called The Tect, and um, it's one of the dialogues I'm having with my past grandfather. He died in 1963. So how am I supposed to have a dialogue with my grandfather if, 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 he's, if I only knew him until five? Well, I go back into history and read about his education and read about his activism. And I go to cemeteries and I learn about um, the, the Haymarket riot. And I learn about the Haymarket martyrs. And I learn about Emma Goldman or or I don't know if any of you guys know this, if anybody here is Roma, Romanian, the gypsies. Um, this is one of the only graveyards in the Chicago area that welcomed the, the gypsy population into, um, their, into their cemetery. And so you can walk through this cemetery and learn so much about who we are as a people. Okay, I'm just gonna keep tangenting, I have to stop. Um, my brother, somebody asked, my brother was a football star at Gordon Tech. We'll never forget the convention and daily ship to kill order. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Tech had, um, who was it? The, the head coach, um, he was called uh, Watermelon Head because um, he had such a massive head. I don't know who asked that question, but Gordon Tech's football team, when we went, I'll never forget going to a, a, a football game. It was called the Prep Bowl. Gordon Tech was playing for the championship. And, and, they, and we got to play um, at the stadium in, at, on the lakefront. Um, and the Catholic school came out and it was all white, except for four or five of our really star players. And we were playing a, a Chicago public school and I, oh, I won't be able to remember the name of it, but it was all black. And it literally was the white Catholic school versus this black public school. And this was 1982 and 1983. Um, Gordon Tech won the game, but the halftime show was dominated by the, um, by the, by the, the band and, and the, um, the, the cheerleaders of the, of the Chicago public school. Um, having an all boys school kind of took away from um, the artistic component, but that's another story. Um, Brian says, Isabel Wilkerson is such a great author. I had the pleasure of hearing her talk and have dinner with her when I was at North Central. Oh, did you really? You're way lucky, Brian. Um, can, can we open this up to questions? Do, do people wanna um, maybe ask me questions? Um, about schools or, or even talk about your own personal experience and maybe we can relate that to Chicago history. Uh-oh, this sounds like a classroom on remote learning. <laughs> Eric Gu, that name looks familiar. Um, no questions or, or comments or any pushback on any of my political views? Oh, got a chat. Can you talk a little about Jane Addams' impact on the education in Chicago? The summary of, okay. Can you talk about, yeah, the, um, so when, when Jane Addams came to Chicago, um, she had just, and again, I, I think Ann Keating is going to really be able to fill this in with greater detail, but um, Jane Addams uh, grew up outside of Chicago. Um, if anybody can look that up, she, she grew up in, in, as a Quaker as a member of the Society of Friends. And her father was a very successful mill owner um, in Northern um, Illinois. Um, so she came from money. She went to Rockford College, which was an elite um, women's college um, at the time, and then traveled to Europe as um, 
as a travel to Europe as would be for the wealthy of, of that era of the late 19th century. I traveled to Europe for several years and, and she kind of had a, a, not a conversion experience, but um, uh, and in, she, she recognized the connection between poverty and uh, became a part of a movement during the industrial period. Some call, I, on a religious level, they call it the quickening, um, but um, she saw the need for social service in the, the, the poor ethnic neighborhoods of in, the, in, in industrial communities. So she came to Chicago with the intent of trying to make a difference. So um, her fa with her father's money, uh, they bought the Hull House, which was a former um, home of an industrialist. And I'm not gonna be able to give the history behind that. Um, but it was in an area of Chicago where the great industrialists were building their great homes in the 1860s and 70s. And then suddenly as the ethnic community moved into Maxwell Street, um, kind of made it impossible for the wealthy to live their glorious lifestyles in peace. So they moved to communities like Oak Park and Evanston and the North Shore, um, and then found ways of um, commuting to their industrial areas. If anybody's visited the stockyards, it, it, you, you couldn't imagine what it must have been like to live near the stockyards, a uh, place where they were slaughtering 7 million animals a year. I mean, this, the Bubbly Creek is um, noted for the bubbles of the nitrogen that are still coming from the bottom of the Chicago uh, River um, and that one little stretch. But anyway, so when Jane Addams came to Chicago, she saw a desperate need and, and the, the Hull House was, and if anybody's visited the museum, it's just an amazing place. Um, Jane is also a feminist. Um, some would also um, in, in contend that she was um, her, um, her sexual, oh, I don't know how to say this. She, was she a lesbian or not? Did she have a lifelong partner as a woman? The, 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 the people who direct the Hull House would argue absolutely um, she did have a lifelong partner and they had their own home um, in, in New England that they would visit in the summer. But Jane's sexuality shouldn't be a part of our understanding of her commitment to the poor and her commitment to creating opportunities for um, the European settlers who were coming into Chicago. And if you look at the maps of that area by the University of Illinois, Chicago, um, you'll see the diversity was amazing. Um, they, and there was actually communities where um, black people and Eastern Europeans lived together um, in that area by Maxwell Street. Chinatown actually um, evolves in the 1880s after the Chicago fire. Uh, the real segregation starts in Bronzeville and those other communities after 1919 with the great black migration um, and the race riots that occurred in 1919, which is another story. So Jane Addams Hull House, if you look at a map, was I think like maybe a couple a square mile. You know, she kept adding buildings and educational opportunities. Much of the critique of Jane Addams educational philosophy is that she was trying to bring people into the middle class from the working class. And so she didn't have a lot of sympathy uh, for the radical union organizers of the time. Uh, there's a story that Jane Addams negotiated a settlement between Pullman and the Pullman workers during one of the one of the riots, her sympathies were not necessarily with union agency as much as giving people the opportunity to get an education and to access the um, the middle class through education and refinement. Uh, she had she conducted dance classes and um, um, th there was childcare. There, I mean things that we take for granted today were radical notions in the 1890s. Why, why, would you need, um, why would you need daycare for your children if they're working or if, because again, there were no child labor laws until um, the Wilson administration. So I'm tangenting a lot with Jane Addams. She's an inspiration. Uh, she was pro a prolific writer too. And she wrote on all these subjects too, if you get an opportunity to look at some of those things. Um, some credit Eliza Chapel as being the first public school teacher in Chicago. 
given Chicago's rich educational history, how come we do not more hear about her? Oh, that's, yeah, okay. Brian, you're, you're out of my league right now. Um, I, I, I might comment that, you know, you know, women have traditionally dominated elementary school and junior high school and men tended to move into the high school area. High school, high school was not mandatory um, until the 19, to the progressive era, until probably Wilson's administration. Um, and then, of course, the New Deal brings in even more educational reforms. But um, why don't we hear about more about the women's influence on public education? We, we might um, go back and, and look at why do we um, elevate the, um, oh wait, here's another, another way of looking at that. Um, one of my favorite graveyards in Chicago is a great walk um, um, in Uptown. Um, has anybody been to um, um, Graceland? Where, where all the industrialists are buried. Um, and if you go to Graceland Cemetery, you can Google it real quick and, and see that all the great industrialists are buried there. Um, where are all the educators? Um, probably in the pauper's grave area. You know, teachers really don't get adequate income that can support a family until our unions gain traction in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues would might argue that, that you know that's another insight that my grandfather um, has that I should talk to him about. Um, again, I'm getting into the seance stuff. But my grandfather was the secretary of the CIO, the Congress for Industrial Organizations, in the 1930s, and he was also the secretary of education um, for the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT. Um, in the 1930s. Kermit got heavily involved in the union movement in the 1920s and 30s and got fired from his first job at Ann Arbor High School um, because of his union activity in the CIO. My father, Kermit Eby, remembers when my grandfather, Kermit, was working for the CIO uh, during the, in the 1930s and actually visited Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the White House. Uh, with my grandfather. He was about 13 at the time. But um, Kermit, my grandfather, wasn't intimidated by anybody and, and went to Franklin's office and, and spoke candidly, candidly with him about the need for union representation um, for laborers. One of the problems Kermit had with that in regards to his education position was that when the leaders gained power in the union movement, they tended to seek out the same income that the industrialists had. So suddenly their administrative qualifications um, moved them away from the workers they were representing, um, which, which is a whole nother discussion. Um, you tell me of your experience. How much time do we have, Tiffany? You we still have, have the, like 20 more minutes. Oh no. If you want, you don't, <laughs> you're about, you're at like the four, almost at the 40 minute mark. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's up to you. Let me, let me try the share the screen thing. Cause I want to, I'm trying to still get some action from folk. And, and I'm assuming all of us are of the same baby boomer generation. Um, so that maybe we could even share some of our insights um, into, you know, what is going on with Chicago education. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Chicago has, is having such difficulty returning to, now can you see my screen? Oh, can you even hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, um, right now it's black. But. Yeah, see there, there's an issue. I'm so 20th century. 
Okay. Well, I was going to share this. Th um, there's this in regards to public education. Why is CPS having such difficulty? Um, one would just be the age of their the buildings. Can you imagine trying to keep Lane Tech clean and safe for their students? It, it to me, it's almost the I've got as, as many as ten billion dollars would be required. Um, or I'm sorry, $1 billion in infrastructure development, um, 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 uh, in, 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 in order to keep those, the, these schools clean and, and, and safe uh, during the pandemic, they would need about a billion dollars just to hire the, the staff necessary. Um, if, if you've been to any Chicago public schools, now there is an alternative too, I guess, and, and I have a good a conservative Christian friend of mine who um, started a, a, a public school in Austin, not a public school, I'm sorry, a magnet school for um, that's private, right? So it's publicly funded, but it's outside of the contractual obligations of the union and, and the teachers. And I, and I haven't looked into how, how his school is doing, um, but it was, it, it had investments from private companies. He, he got about $2 million uh, to invest in the school. So his kids are, you know, thriving, but it outside of the context of the public school system. Um, has your teaching pedagogy been influenced by your family members that were educators? Oh boy. I think you can tell that yes, the answer is absolutely. Um, okay, now here was my question. I, I think when we look at our public schools, I, I think probably one of the most important parts of the reform that's going to take place from this pandemic is something as simple as the block schedule. Um, the block schedule allows kids to only have two or three content classes a day and they alternate. They have, they'll have PE, uh, science, in literature one day and then the next day boom, they go to the other three classes. Um, home ec, need more boys in home ec. I would do so much better at boiling water if I had taken home ec. Actually I did. Um, but anyway, a block schedule allows kids to spend more time on, on one subject every day than another. They're actually, when they're opening up the schools right now, the block schedule is in effect for most of the Western suburban schools. Um, that would be a reform that we, we might see happening. Um, you, you also look at the history of education in Chicago as a series of reforms and reactions to social problems. So when Brown v. Board of Education took place, did the Chicago schools suddenly become integrated? Absolutely not. The, the, there was actually a dismantling under um, the neoliberal design of Mayor, um, what's his name? Um, I'm still annoyed at him. Um, but schools got closed down in neighborhoods. And so the magnet school system actually took away from local public schools. That would have been an important component. Um, Again, I'm tangenting here. Um, so if we took it the, look at the, the essential values of public and private education, what do we want our kids to have access to? Obviously safe learning environments, obviously not having to travel an hour, an hour and a half to get to a, to a, to a magnet school. I've met kids in the Chicago public schools who commute an hour to and an hour home uh, from the schools to be able to go to a really good school that's not in their neighborhood. Why can't we offer a, a public school that serves all of the needs of all of the children um, of our communities? And, and I think that's an ongoing struggle um, that we have on, on all three levels, the, the elementary, the, the high school, and the collegiate. Um, and, and I think my life kind of if, when I'm writing a biography, I'm, I'm seeing that I've lived through all of those experiences indirectly, but because I'm a white, cisgendered, affluent, educated male, I don't, the, the impact of all these issues don't 
don't really impact my children as much as it does the children of others. My oldest daughter, Lauren, oh, I, that's the way I'll end this, okay? My oldest daughter, Lauren Clemens Eby, uh, is a PhD from Harvard. Um, she's a linguist. She had all the privileges um, associated with great public schools. She went to Oak Park River Forest High School. She was in all the AP and elite classes. She learned German as a junior. My mother's German. That's another story. My Namutti is Messlingen in Deutschland. So she picked up German as in high school. Then she picked up Spanish. Um, and as a professor of linguistics in anthropology at SUNY Albany, she serves the working class and the immigrant populations of New York. Um, and the strain on her as a professor up for tenure is incredible. And this is a woman who has a PhD from Harvard. Um, if she had gone into finance or taken her linguistic skills and, and become a translator for a major corporation, she'd be making so much money. Not that money makes you happy because Lauren has an, inherited the agency and activism that I have, my father has, her mother has, her grandfather, grandmother have as Mennonite brethren. Um, we, we see our responsibility in education to help bring about social justice. And I, I guess that's the way I'm, I'm going to end this talk, um, is that my commitment as an educator has been to expand opportunity and um, also um, recognition of our connection to the problems that um, have yet to be solved. Um, okay, is everybody, who's, is everybody gone? Oh, we have nine participants left, okay. All right, so is that a good enough conclusion, Brian? Did <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't bragging about my kids. Well, I did at the end. Lauren and my granddaughter Beatrice, she's she turned seven Wednesday, um, and she's already trilingual. She speaks a little French. She speaks Spanish better than Lauren, um, and because of the educational opportunities she's had. Um, I have a feeling Beatrice is going to be quite successful. Um, not, not financially, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> Joan, was I, was I all over the place? You're the only person I see. I'm here. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brian and Tiffany are here. Joan, what's your, what's your educational background? Um, I'm a writer and I find subjects in themselves interesting and so that's why I tuned in. Yeah. Um, my education was a graduate of Mundelein College, which was an independent um, I know women's college Yeah. up until 1980s, late 90s, when it merged with Loyola University. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember being at a grape boycott in 1976 and demonstrating in front of Mundelein. Uh, <laughs> well, we did have people go off to Selma and march in those. Yeah. Times. Do you know Orr? Isn't Orr a Mundelein professor? That yes, was, he was at one time. Yes. I met him a couple times. He, he's quite a character. Oh, that's so cool. So you're from and, Rogers Park. Um, the history of the school itself and the women that graduated from there are enriching our city of Chicago all over the place. Yeah. We're still in contact with most of them, and we just had a reunion recently. Nice. That's cool. So did you grow up in Chicago? Yes, I did. I, uh, I grew up on the east side, which was um, south of 100th Street. Um, really? Many people don't even realize it's part of Chicago because they think right. it's it's right where the skyline, a uh, skyway walk goes over the city. A uh, bicycle and, dome, yeah. Yes, and it goes all the way up to 106th or 108th. Yeah. It's mostly Mexican now, right? Hispanic. I really don't know. Oh, okay. 
All right, you wanna, you, thank you for sharing that, Joan. And good luck with your writing. I need an editor for my dissertation. You doing anything the next couple months? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I think I interviewed Brian at one time, didn't I, Brian? A couple times, I'm sure. A couple times when you started out? Yep. Well, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for the first of our two uh, virtual Chicago Author Series talks uh, this fall. Um, again, thank you, Kermit, for your insight into education and your, <laughs> and he's laughing over there, uh, your education uh, career um, and some of your advice and insights. Um, Again, next weekend, we will have Ann Durkin Keating. She's a professor at North Central College in Naperville. Uh, she'll be talking about her book on Juliet Kinsey. So hopefully see you uh, again next weekend.